Here are three different graphs, each on six vertices. And you notice that none of them have the following as a substructure, three vertices, each pair of which are adjacent. So I wonder, if that's the case, what's the maximum number of edges we can pack in in such a graph? That's the question we're gonna to answer today in Mantel's theorem. And we're gonna give two different proofs of an upper bound for the number of edges on a graph on n vertices that has no triangle in it. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar, and today we're gonna to discuss Mantel's theorem. And it's a theorem about graphs that gives us an upper bound on the number of edges we can pack in if we don't have a three cycle in the graph. And we're gonna give two proofs of this theorem. The first one, which uses a sort of standard induction argument, but the second one that's really special and uses a mathematical tool that comes out of seemingly nowhere to be able to solve this problem. Okay, so let's investigate the situation by looking at graphs with six vertices first. So say we have a graph with six vertices and it doesn't have a three cycle in it. Let's see how many edges we can pack in. So one thing we could do is make the graph by part type, meaning that we split the vertices into two sides and have edges going between each side with every single vertex on one side adjacent to every single vertex on the next. Now, if we do that, then it won't be the case that we'll have a three cycle uh, because a three cycle can't possibly be a substructure in a graph that's bipartite. If we split the two vertices, the three vertices into two sets, uh, then we're forced to have two vertices in the same set be adjacent. Okay, so here's an example of a bipartite graph on six vertices, and here's another one. And we notice that the number of edges in each is the product of the number of vertices on each side. So if you have M and N vertices on each side, the product here is the number of edges. Okay, if our graph has six vertices, then we know for sure that the following is gonna happen. If we have N vertices on one side, then the other side is gonna have six minus N vertices. And so the total number of edges is N times six minus N. Now, the sum of these numbers is six, so this is maximized right when we're in the middle where N is three and subsequently six minus N is three as well. So the maximum number of edges we get in a substructure like this is nine. Okay, what would this look like in general? So we might have K vertices on this side and then if n is the total number of vertices, we'd have n minus k on this side, the product of which is k times n minus k. So that's the number of edges that we'd have if we fill this in with edges to maximize as much as possible. Now to maximize even more, we can make these two values equal. And that happens when k is precisely n over 2, meaning we'd have n over 2 here and n over 2 here. So at least for bipartite graphs, the maximum number of edges we'd have is n squared over 4 if the graph has n vertices. It turns out miraculously that this is actually an upper bound period. And that statement is the statement of Mantel's theorem. So let's actually write this down. So Mantel's theorem states the following. If you have a graph G on n vertices and it has no three cycle in it, then an upper bound on the number of edges is n squared over four. And we know how to roughly achieve this upper bound. If n happened to be even, we can create a bipartite graph with n over two and n over two vertices in each part. And the number of edges between them would be exactly n squared over four. If n is odd, we'd have something close to n over two on each side and we can flood to get something close. Okay, so we wanna prove this and I wanna start with a proof that is relatively manageable, and then another proof that's really quite interesting and insightful. And both proofs are gonna rely on observation for graphs on n vertices that don't have a three cycle in them. Okay, before embarking on any of the proofs, I wanna establish a lemma that's gonna be useful for both proofs. And that lemma makes an observation about a bound on the sum of the degrees of adjacent vertices. So say we had two vertices u and v here that were adjacent in a graph that had no three cycle. Let's look at the vertices that are adjacent to v and the vertices that are adjacent to u. 
So I'll make a cloud for the vertices that are adjacent to U, and I'm gonna, for a second, exclude V. And similarly, I'll make a cloud for the vertices that are adjacent to V, but not include U in it. The number of vertices in this cloud is the degree of U, but minus one because we haven't included V in the count. And similarly, the, the, the number of vertices in this cloud is the degree of V minus one. Okay, but this graph has no three cycles. So that means that these two sets are actually disjoint because if we had a vertex that was in both, it would be adjacent to U and V, and then we'd form a three cycle, which is forbidden in the graphs that we're considering. So these two sets are disjoint, and by the way we've constructed them, they don't include U or V as well. So the sum of the number of vertices in this cloud and this cloud, and then adding these two vertices, is bounded above by the number of vertices in the entire graph. So this tells us the degree of U minus one plus the degree of V minus one, the sum of the number of vertices in this cloud and this cloud, together with these two vertices U and V, of which there are two of, is less than or equal to N. And we notice we can cancel out the negative ones with the two to get that the sum of the degree of U and V is at least N. So we're gonna write this lemma up here on the corner because we're gonna use it in both proofs that we present. Okay, so let's start with our first proof. I wanna play with a few examples. So first, let's start with the case n equals one. So here we have one vertex. We can't have any edges at all, right? So the number of edges is in fact zero, which is less than or equal to n squared over four because that quantity is a fourth. So we're happy with the n equals one case. Okay, let's look at n equals two. So you have two vertices. The maximum of a number of possible edges is one. So E of G in this case is gonna be less than or equal to one. It could be zero. And that quantity is two squared over four. So we're happy in the N equals two case as well. Okay, so what we're gonna do is together with the lemma, make some analysis to see how we can use these base cases and get an inductive argument. Okay, so for our inductive argument, what we'll do is suppose that this entire theorem is true for any graph on fewer than n vertices that has no three cycle in it. So what that means is if you have a graph on m vertices where m is less than n and that graph has no three cycle, then the number of edges in that graph is at most m squared over four. Okay, so what we'll do with this graph is we wanna look at a subgraph somehow to invoke induction, and we're gonna peel off these, any pair of adjacent vertices to do that. So our picture looks something like this. We have a vertex U, a vertex V, and we'll pick U and V to be adjacent. We know we can find an edge in this graph. If this graph had no edges, the number of edges would be zero, and this is automatically satisfied, so we'll pick something like this. Okay, so now we have these edges emanating from U, edges emanating from V, and then like a big blob downstairs for the rest of the graph, which I'm gonna call G prime. Okay, so let's look at all of the edges that involve the vertices V and U. How many are there? So we argued before that this set right over here and this set right over here are completely disjoint. The number of edges in here is the degree of U minus one. And the number of edges in here is the degree of V minus one. Then we have this one edge UV. So the total number of edges here that aren't completely contained between vertices in G prime is the degree of U plus the degree of V minus one. Okay, now what about G prime? G prime is a graph that has n minus two vertices in it. Okay. Also, it's impossible for G prime to have a three cycle in it, because if it did, then this whole graph G would have a three cycle in it as well, which contradicts our assumption. So G prime does not have a three cycle in it, 
it has n minus two vertices, and subsequently, the number of edges in it is bounded above by the number of vertices in it squared over four. Okay, so if you pack this all together, the number of edges in G, we can get an upper bound four. So the number of edges in G, as we see in this picture, is the number of edges in the graph G prime plus the number of edges outside, which we calculated to be this quantity right over here. Degree of U plus degree of V minus one. Okay, but according to our lemma, this quantity right here is less than or equal to N. And according to our inductive hypothesis, we have an upper bound on this thing. So this entire expression is less than or equal to the upper bound on this thing, which is N minus two all squared over four, plus N minus one. We can rewrite this thing here as four N minus four over four, Right? And here we'll get n squared, and then we'll get a minus 4n, which cancels with this 4n, and a plus 4, which cancels with this minus 4, so we're left with n squared over 4. Great. So by this inductive process, we're able to prove that indeed, this graph on n vertices that contains no 3 cycle does have at most n squared over 4 edges. So interesting way to go about this, and now we're gonna go about it a completely different way. Invoking mathematics is quite unexpected. So for the second proof of Mantel's theorem, we're gonna exploit this inequality for every single edge in the graph. So if we do that, we'll have n times the number of edges in the graph is greater than or equal to the sum of this quantity over all the possible edges. So it's the sum over all u, v in the edge set, of the degree of u plus the degree of v. All right, and the idea is this is grid less than or equal to n for every single edge, so this will bound above the sum over all the edges. Now there's something really interesting about this quantity right here. Let's say you think about a particular vertex u. When you look at this particular sum, you'll get a contribution of the degree of u every single time it's adjacent to a particular vertex. So say u is adjacent to v1, then u v1 is an edge, and you'll see the term degree of u in this sum right over here that one time. Then it might be adjacent to another vertex, you'll see the degree of u appear in this sum again. And the number of times in total that you'll see the term degree of u appear is actually the degree of u. So, when you look at the total number of contributions of the term degree of u, the number of contributions is the degree of u itself. So the expression degree of u in this entire sum appears as the degree of u squared. It's the degree of u times the number of times it occurs, which is the degree of u. So we can rewrite this actually as a sum over all vertices in the vertex set of the degree of that vertex squared. And that's a magical thing. And part of why it's magical is we're gonna now use this to get an inequality exploiting some linear algebra. The way I'm gonna do this is construct a vector w that contains as its components the degrees of all the vertices in this graph. Now we haven't labeled the vertices, but I'll pretend we did and label them something like the degree of u or label the vertices u1, u2, etc. up to u sub n. Okay, and now I'm going to introduce another vector, z, which is a vector with n components that contains all ones in its coordinates. Okay, so what you notice about this vector here is it's the sum of the squares of the components of W, which is actually the square of the length of W. So I'm gonna write this as the square of the length of W. So what we're gonna do is exploit that to get an inequality for the size of the edge set in terms of N. So in order to do that, we need to relate this quantity to statistics in terms of the graph. 
Um, so let's see one of the, some of the observations we can possibly make here. So first, if you look at the dot product of W and Z, that is the pairwise products all added together. So that quantity is the sum of all the degrees of the vertices. Okay, but by the handshake lemma, this is twice the edge set. So the dot product of W and Z is a quantity that can be written in terms of the number of edges of the graph. But interestingly, there's this theorem in linear algebra that tells us that the dot product between two vectors in absolute value is less than or equal to the product of the lengths of those vectors. And here we should have had a squared because this is a square of the length of this thing. So if we square these, we get that the square of the dot product is at most the square of the product of the square of the lengths of the two vectors. Now dividing by the length of the square of the length of Z, we get an inequality that gives us a lower bound on this thing. This thing has as its lower bound, the absolute value of the dot product of W and Z divided by the square of the length of Z. Now, why is something like that helpful? Well, we just said that this quantity up top is the sum of the degrees of the vertices, which is twice the edge set. So the thing on the numerator is actually four times the square of the number of edges. And the thing on the denominator is the square of the length of this vector. This vector has n components, all of which are one. So the square of its length is n. And lo and behold, now we have an inequality that has n times the number of edges on one side and four times the number of edges squared over n on the other side. So if we multiply by n and divide by the size of the edge set, we get exactly that n squared over four is an upper bound on the number of edges of the graph. So this is a really fascinating and interesting argument. And it turns out that when trying to prove similar theorems that involve asking for an upper bound while avoiding cycles of larger length, this proof is more amenable to adaptations that allow you to prove upper bounds in those cases. So I hope you liked today's video of these really interesting different proofs of the same theorem. If you did, click the like button and if you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications on future videos.